All right. I am joined by uh, two of my favorite people to have on this show. Uh, they have both been on several times uh, solo, uh, but this is the uh, this is the first crossover episode. Uh, we have uh, uh, coming from uh, the you know Ann Arbor, Michigan, but I like him anyway. Uh, Matt McManus, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know that. I grew up in East Lansing. That 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 takes something from me to say. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, it. go Wolverines. Okay, whatever Jeez. he says, you say. Okay, go All Wolverines. Right. Never mind. Just Lillian. Just Lillian today. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, from Amsterdam, uh, where uh, where she just uh, just started a new academic position there, uh, Lillian uh, Sekertia. Uh These are, uh, you know, I I kind of, um, you know. I mean, I I said in the uh, the description for this uh, that uh, these are these are both uh, fan favorite returning guests, which I actually think is is very true. Like we're we're at, uh, uh, you know, we started this at um, you know nine thirty or so in the morning uh, here on the West Coast uh, on a day we don't usually stream, but I think we uh, I think we have more initial views than we did for the uh, the episode with Zizak last week. So. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, so. Uh, so people, people want to know what uh, people want to know what Matt and Lily have to say, and this is going to be interesting because this is this going to explore uh, an area where, uh, you know, they have some disagreements. Uh, although we'll be exploring the extent of that and what everybody thinks, you know, we sort of, um, you know, half. Uh, we're quite sure whether to call this, you know. I mean, I, I guess just like a discussion would have been safe, but, you know, sort of like half jokingly, half seriously, you know, said, said debate, but then put some scare quotes around it in the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the title. But, uh, this was, um, uh, but anyway, this was, uh, this was their idea. Uh, wanted to, uh, you know, I am just, I'm just happy to, to, uh, to, to host, although I certainly have views about this stuff and those, those will be coming up. Uh, but before we, we kind of get into the meat of it, I mean, I think, I think Lillian, you were the one who was originally like, this would be interesting. You know, I, I want to, you know, kind of talk to Matt about the liberalism stuff. Mm -hmm. So so do you want to say a little bit about what you were hoping to explore? Well, yeah. So thanks Ben. And thanks Matt for, I I did, I, I DM'd Matt and I was like, let's talk about socialism. Um, so I, I have a series of like ambivalent uh, ambivalences about liberalism's relationship to socialism. I think my official position is that I, I don't uh, collapse the, the two, um, but I think I've said on my my own podcast numerous times. Like we have a running series called "What is What is Liberalism" that we're going to build on. Cool. Um, and I think that one thing I, I I know, or one position I also have is that I, I think socialism is not illiberal. And I used to think that there was no problem with this on, on the left. So I used to think that on the socialist left, um, our position, like, you know, that something that was shared was that um, liberalism is not really the best uh, protector or advancer of liberal rights. And that usually that has come from from the left, um, and so one of the the things that liberal that socialism would do is um, protect certain liberal uh, goods um, better than capitalism does. And so, so I used to think, you know, and this was uh, comes along with the attachment that the socialist left has to internal democracy. Um, to uh, pushing beyond but defending the advances of like the so-called bourgeois revolutions, however bourgeois one thinks they really were. And like, you know, in broad strokes, I kind of thought that was the view. And I've recently become concerned because I think once one gets a little older, and I'm not that old, I'm only 31, um, but I'm, I'm past uh, my, uh, the, the romance of communism phase in the sense where I just like, you know, uh, think everything is all of a, a an, an ideological piece and um, in the way that I just described. And I think that, I, I do think that there are illiberal 
parts to the left. And um, that concerns me. Um, but that doesn't make me a defender of liberalism exactly. So there's, I have some ambivalent views and I'm wondering uh, what to do, what to do about them because I, I also think, you know, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Like I, I worry about various things with liberalism, but that kind of background concern and just, you know, to make it kind of concrete for people. What do I mean by the left being illiberal? Well, I think that, that various positions that the left holds about its own internal democracy and internal culture can be illiberal. Number one, I've experienced it many times and gotten burned. Um, it's not a reason to like disregard these organizational forms, but there are just problems. And then number two, I think that the left has developed, uh, has diverged from a position on civil liberties that it has traditionally held recently. And this also concerns me. Um, and so I used to think that it was a straw man, that the left is illiberal. And now I've realized that actually this exists. So anyway, sorry to take up so much time, Matt. I maybe turn it over to, to Matt. Yeah, uh, no, that's, that, that's, I mean, that actually seemed very concise to me. What's, uh, so oh, yeah. as, uh, as, as much as the, the temptation, uh, Birds have made a jump in with a bunch of stuff. I think about that. Uh, I want to. Uh, I want to turn it over to our other guest. Uh, so, so maybe as the uh, as the person here who probably out of the three people on the screen has the strongest view on this, uh, the um, like, and I'm, I'm never. I'm actually. So one of the reasons this is going to be interesting to me. Uh, this is going to be interesting to me is because. Uh, Sometimes I think, yeah, Matt and I think exactly the same thing about this. And sometimes it seems like, oh, maybe it is a little different. I don't know. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I change don't. day by day, so I wouldn't worry about it. Right. On any day we might coincide or break apart or I might be on your side or I might be. On I, I, mean, I certainly don't go around calling myself a liberal socialist, a socialist, but some of that's just, uh, you know, aesthetics. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but in any case, um, I, uh, but, but as the person with the sort of most strongly held position, uh, maybe you could just kind of start us off with like a few minutes of, uh, of sort of what, um, you know, what you mean when you use this phrase, liberal socialism, you know, what, what, uh, how do you see the relationship between these, these two ideas? And then we can, and then we can turn back to Lily and get some of her thoughts about that. Sure. Well, I just wanted to start off by saying that uh, I'm really grateful we got to do this. Uh, I've been watching and reading some of Lillian's stuff over the course of the week. Uh, and I just want to say, first off, that I thought your lecture on uh, socialist pluralism was really brilliant. Uh, and I enjoyed it a great deal. And actually, it's kind of a good segue to my own thinking about this, because uh, in that lecture, you talk a little bit about the romance uh, between liberalism and capitalism and how it seems to be fraying. And that led me to the conclusion that I'm kind of in a love triangle uh, with liberalism, capitalism, uh, and I guess myself as a democratic socialist, where I'm the other man, um, and I'm trying to sit there and basically tell liberals, like, you know, I know you two have been together for a very long time, but he's always been kind of abusive, and you just don't feel the same way with him as you do with me, right? So this is an amazing together. metaphor, but okay, yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, I've been watching a lot of rom-coms lately, you know, can you tell? Uh, but anyway, it's close to Valentine's Day. In terms of... Um, my own approach to this. Uh, I absolutely agree that I think there are ambivalences and I'm by no means uncritical uh, of what I might call the more possessive individualist versions of liberalism. I think that for the most part, those are regressive uh, and they've been a burden both for socialists and for uh, the more emancipatory dimensions of the liberal tradition going forward. And I think one of our major theoretical tasks is precisely to try to demarcate what's integral to liberalism, especially its more egalitarian aspects uh, and break those off uh, from the kind of more possessive individualist approaches to capitalism. In terms, though, of what I think liberalism has to offer socialists, uh, and I do think liberalism has quite a bit to offer socialists, I would kind of demarcate it in three separate ways. Uh, one, I think that historically, uh, and Marx was very clear on this, we have to appreciate uh, the kind of influence of bourgeois liberal ideology in breaking down antiquarian views of the world that were predicated on what Charles Taylor calls a uh, model of hierarchical complementarity. Very simply, uh, older views of society tended to see it as more or less a pyramid or a great chain of being was another metaphor. Everyone had their place within that, but it was by no means considered by anybody uh, a place where everyone was equal, right? Uh, the king had more dignity than the peasants. Uh, the peasants had less dignity than the knights. You know, all the typical stuff, right? Uh, and I think that by advancing, say, a model of a social contract, 
uh, which saw society not as a great chain of being, but instead as an artificial compact between equals uh, that people voluntarily entered into and could exit if it didn't serve their interests. Liberal theory uh, took a major advance forward in terms of its emancipatory potential. Uh, and I think that the Marxist tradition and the socialist tradition broadly carry on from this legacy. So I think theoretically that's important. The second thing that I think is important that liberals have to offer socialists uh, is what Irving Howell talks about in his essay, Liberalism and Socialism, Articles of Conciliation, uh, which my friend Sean Gooday at Jacobin recommended to me and I think is just a seminal essay that more people deserve to read, uh, where he points out that socialists have always been far more sensitive than liberals uh, to the dangers to liberalism posed by concentrations of economic power uh, and the way that this can lead to various forms of economic domination, uh, which more Republican oriented liberals need to be concerned with. However, right, Howe points out that liberals for their part have also been more sensitive at points uh, than socialists on questions like so state domination. Uh, so Howe points out that Marx and his um, the Civil War in France is quite critical of the notion of div the division of powers, for example. Because uh, he rightly aligns it with this Montesquieuian idea that we want to check the democratic potential of the masses uh, by making sure that they can't pass you know, crazy legislation that will redistribute wealth downwards. Now, while historically that's the case, uh, Howe points out that we have very good reasons to take seriously this idea of dividing powers. Uh, and actually, it's kind of burdened Marxism to be aligned with this idea that we should have limitless powers granted to a kind of unified state or unified state sovereign to exercise um, authority in the name of the people. You know, it's had some bad impacts. And I would also argue that many of the classical liberal rights that puts checks on state power are also things that most socialists uh, should want to value, right? Not rights to private property, certainly not extensive rights to private property, but things like rights to expression, assembly, um, multicultural toleration. Uh, if anything, I think the socialist position would be that we want these rights to be even more entrenched and more expansive than they were before. Uh, and then the third thing that I think it's important to note as socialists is the good Marxist point. Uh, which is that I think many leftists today are very attracted not to a kind of Marxist position on socialism, but a Sorelian position on socialism. Uh, there's this almost millenarian belief that what we need to do is radically rupture uh, history and transition to a totally new kind of society. Uh, and as Igor Shuket Broad, who I know we're both fond of, uh, points out in his book, that's a very anti-Marxist position, right? The true dialectical standpoint is that any kind of socialist society that we transition to is going to be, to use the term, uh, stamped uh, with features of the old. Uh, this is because in many senses, the old uh, constitutes a progression over the even older, and we don't want to throw that away uh, in our transition to socialism, right? Uh, now, what features those will be, I kind of mentioned that earlier on. I think it's important to divide certain kinds of powers to preserve the integral liberal rights. Uh, but I think that we need to be more dialectical uh, in our approach to these issues than more Sorelian or millenarian socialists have been in the past. And yeah, Ben, you do got to learn to relax on Saturday. Grab yourself a drink or something, buddy. <laughs> All right. Uh, Lilia, do you want to you weigh in on that? Not, so, the, not the Saturday um, issue, but the rest of it. Okay, so I think there are three points that I'd like to make. Um, the first is that there is a difference between liberalism as an ideology. At least these are the points that, uh, that Matt's making. There's liberalism as an ideology. So I'm going to call that liberalism with a capital L. There's liberalism with a little L, which has to do with the kinds of constitutive norms that, uh, Matt's saying he thinks are valuable. And I, and I tend to also think that they are valuable in that way, um, in the way that you described in terms of um, the integral parts of liberalism seem to be egalitarianism, and then um, uh, against hierarchical, hierarchical complementarity. Um, yeah, and I think that's, he's, it's right to say that socialists carry on this legacy. Um, and then the third point is liberal socialism. So that's the construction of a normative I ideal. So there's the kind of, there's the ideology, there's the, the, the constitutive norms, and then there's the liberal socialism. Um, and I do wonder what the relationship between the ideology and the constitutive norms and like all three of those terms to me, um, there's some relationship between all of them. And what concerns me about um, much normative political philosophy is its sort of uh, 
it's presumption that you can take liberalism with a liberal L, the constitutive norms, and then project it onto um, the future without further complication. And I think it's like interesting to, that you use the word like see it dialectically. Um, what I think would be true is that whatever those constitutive norms are, they have a certain social shape given existing material conditions. And, um, and that has some kind of direct relationship with the ideology, liberalism with a capital L. And what I hear being said is that the, the, the socialism of the future, the different material conditions, would realize those constitutive norms under different material conditions. And so the ideology part would stop being a problem. Um, that's, I think that's possible. Um, but like, I think it seems too easy to me. And I wonder um, what you think about that or even what Ben thinks about that. Like there is a, there is a kind of save and rescue move that is being done. Um, at the level of normative theory, and then, uh, but, and and I feel that it's being posited that you can kind of say, okay, we can if imagine a certain set of social changes, and then this is what socialism would be like. Um, but it, it strikes me that like often, what a dialectical position is 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 a kind of, and this is just going to introduce the Hegelian language is like. It is a kind of imminent critique of the existing society. So one way of doing a critique of capitalism is that you take uh, a certain set of normative principles and you just apply them, like just or unjust. Like I would think that Rawls does this. Like we have ideal theory, we apply it to non-ideal conditions, we can see that it's not just and we want to make it more just. Um, the, but it strikes me that like the, a dialectical approach implies a different method, which would be imminent critique. So you take the expectations and the constitutive norms of the present, and then they they work on and against or through the contradictions of that present. So what comes out the other side of that um, might involve those norms, but might be something else entirely. Like it might be, they would be ordered in a different way. They would be understood differently. Um, and so what what worries me about the posit of liberal socialism is that if that kind of transformation is not seen um, as a transformation in how we understand the norms themselves, then the ideology problem comes in. Like, because you start just applying liberal norms to the present, and I'm not sure how to see their movement and transformation into something else. So there is like a I think there's, is, is my set of, is this making sense? Um, so like all of that is true, but I think there's like a, there's a kind of background method question that comes up for me when I start thinking about what it means to think dialectically at all. And what I tend to see when people adopt a liberal position, so, um, you know, a kind of Rawlsian liberalism or an egalitarian liberalism is that that method question tends to fall into the background. Like people tend to just assume, you know, granted, and then like, we're just going to apply the good parts and then forget about the bad parts. But like in practice, um, I, I, I think that there, there's a liberalism is more contradictory. And so I'm not that comfortable with like the, the confrontation with the contradictions in the present and then the kind of speculation about what the future would be like, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it, so, so Matt, uh, if you're, if you're itching to respond to do that right now, uh, I could let you do that. Otherwise um, I, I wanted to, because, because you're saying, well, actually, sorry, if you are, please, please do that. Uh, you're, you just muted yourself again. Sorry, no, I just wanted to say very briefly that uh, I empathize uh, with a lot of these anxieties because methodologically, I'm not entirely comfortable with it either, right? Uh, this is kind of an ongoing theoretical task for myself. Uh, and the way that I tend to mince it is that I think that there are two jobs uh, that we need to engage in as democratic socialists. Uh, and I know that you have some sympathy for this as well, right? Uh, one is to continue to develop uh, the theory of power and domination uh, that I think has its roots in the Marxist and Hegelian tradition, although I think Marx improves upon Hegel a lot. Uh, through people like Foucault, through people like Jameson, 
Uh, and I try to do that myself, uh, for instance, with my books on postmodernity, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the other task that Marx sometimes does undervalue uh, is the notion of constructing a socialist theory of justice, uh, not just for the reasons of theoretical uh, economy, if you want, uh, but also because I think it's important to have a theory of justice in a battle of maneuver uh, with our reactionary opponents, for example, something that can inspire people with a concrete vision of the future. Uh, now, how to link a theory of power and domination to a theory of justice uh, is something that is an immense methodological and theoretical task. And I'm not fully comfortable saying uh, how I would accomplish that just yet. Uh, I always tell Ben, you know, one day my big book on Marx and Rawls uh, and Wendy Brown will come out uh, and then, you know, I'll die peacefully. But, you know, that's a few years away. Uh, I do think, though, that we can see a connection uh, between this kind of Rawlsian outlook, not to mention the liberal outlook and Marxism, uh, if you go through something like the history of German idealism. So, for instance, Kant, who is an iconoclastic liberal, uh, shares a lot in common with Marx in the sense that he also argues that we need to be very critical of the surface forms that society takes for us, particularly the reified forms of morality uh, that are often projected onto it by reactionaries, for example. And we need to adopt a level of self-consciousness in relation to them and see them as products of human will. I think that's a very Marxist idea. Uh, and Kant goes in one direction with this that Rawls eventually picks up and saying, this is why we need to posit abstract principles of justice to contrast and compare uh, how well our society is living up to these more rationalistic kinds of ideas. Marx takes it in a very different direction by saying we should be critical of the reified forms of ideology brought up by material conditions. So that's kind of where my thinking is going in terms of constructing a genealogy that might eventually link these two separate desires of my point, uh, sorry, of mine um, together. But again, it's something that I'm positing for the future. Uh, we can get into a bit of detail about what I think a liberal socialist society might look like later on, but that's kind of my uh, methodological point. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a, this is interesting to me, and I, I, I should warn people, I'm the only one of the people on the screen right now who's not going to use the word dialectical to describe anything, I think, uh, the uh, just because just I, I... You'll be the synthesis at the end of our dialogue. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, I have... Uh, uh, I worry... You know, like I hear interesting people using that language to mean a lot of interesting things, but I worry that often which interesting things they mean um, are um, are always clear to me, right? You know, because because I, I I think you know I think that language often like gestures in a set of theoretical virtues that I think people should care about, like uh, being attentive to the fact that things change, and you know that they. Uh, being attentive to to nuance and messiness, you know, being. Uh, you know, uh, thinking that there are, you know, possibilities about things that will happen in the future that are contained in the present, you know, like, like, like all of that is, is right. You know, I, I just, um, anyway, whatever, but, you know, maybe we're back to aesthetic preferences here, but, uh, but, but I do, you know, cause Lillian said a bunch of interesting things a minute ago about, about how to think about norms. And I do want to get into that, but I also, I also want to, I also want to push a little bit because because she she said um, she talked about liberalism with capital L and liberalism you know with the with little L where I think you know liberalism with a little L as I understood it is is just sort of uh, you know caring about a certain set of of liberal you know uh, liberal rights norms uh, and uh, liberalism with a big L is something. Um, more ideologically or historically specific, I think. So if, um, I mean, the, the way I, I mean, something that bothers me sometimes about the, like I remember when I read that Irving Howe essay that Matt is talking about and some of the way that Howe does it there and, you know, the times when I feel like I might disagree with Matt about some of the stuff, uh, about some of what, you know, the formulations I see, him using are that uh, I would want to separate like like whenever I hear people talk of like leftists talk about liberalism I always want to know like okay but like what kind of liberalism are we talking about right I mean let's let's disambiguate that a little bit because liberalism seems to be could mean a lot of different things and maybe they're they're related to each other in interesting ways but they're still they're still really different and um, oftentimes you know, like reading how I, I get this unsettling sense that we're talking about everything from like, you know, people like other, you know, 
people that Irving Howe knows in New York who, you know, who would like, who have political positions that would conventionally be thought of as liberalism. Uh, and we're talking about everything from that to like, you know, 18th century political philosophy. And, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm very he- hesitant about, you know, lumping all that together. You know, those, those seem, those seem really different to me. Right. In other words, like, so there's, it, it seems to me that we could differentiate between at least like, I don't know, four or five things that people mean by, by liberalism. You know, one of them, uh, I think, you know, within like one of them is just sort of thinking that a certain set of, you know, liberal rights are really important. Um, as like a, as just sort of a, a me, like an immediate, like kind of political position, you know, like, like sort of kind of the stuff that Lillian was talking about at the very beginning of, of her, uh, of her first comments, you know, like civil liberties are really important. You know, we care a lot about free speech. Uh, they maybe throw in Howe's point about separation of powers that, you know, that, that we, we, uh, you know, we want, uh, you know, like we think that certain kinds of checks on, you know, executive authority might be important, right? That's, so that's like one thing, like maybe call that like constitutional liberalism. But then there's also, uh, you know, philosophical liberalism, which we can maybe separate into like very like, like a narrower kind of philosophical liberalism, like, you know, what, you know, uh, you know, Kant or Locke or, you know, or, or, uh, or even, you know, or even John Stuart Mill, you know, thought, you know, obviously those people disagreed with each other about a lot of things, but still, Right. And then like maybe something much more general, like like I think Rawls somewhere just says, like, ultimately what I mean by liberalism is that I, I think that it's just universal moral equality. Right. Everybody, uh, everybody should should sort of everybody counts the same, you know, when we're when, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, when we're thinking about normative questions about justice. Uh, and then there's liberalism as a as a as like a as a political current. Right. There's like liberalism. You know, as and I don't just mean like you know Democrats in America in 2023, but or their equivalents in other countries. Although that's certainly part of what I mean. But like, you know, I, I think like liberalism has existed for the last couple hundred years uh, as a distinct political current that grew up, you know, as much in opposition to us as in opposition to conservatives, right? That they uh, that that like liberalism as opposed to radicalism uh, or conservatism. And, and those, I, I guess my starting bias, I mean, before we even kind of explore some of the, you know, some of the other stuff that Lily had said about norms and history and all that, uh, I'd just be interested to hear from both of you on this, right? You know, my, my starting bias is just to, like, be suspicious of any attempt to collapse all of those liberalisms into each other to just think, well, no, these are just, like, different things that, like, what you think about one isn't going to necessarily tell us very much about what you think about others. I mean, I think that um, whew, this is a harder conversation than I thought it would be. Um, it's complicated. So I think that my first response to what you're saying, Ben, is that like I think there's basically agreement between Matt and I about the value of the constitutive norms. So liberal, like egalitarianism and the contrast with conservatism uh, make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I'm sure that there are others. I mean, I think that's the big one. And, and moral universalism in particular, which follows from a sort of egalitarian understanding of the person. Um, and like, you know, in my own work, like when I teach like a feminism course, I've recently started s- starting with the conservative view. And then it motivates so that even liberal feminism starts to not look so bad to my students after that, you know, because there's gender complementarism. And then there's this, the, li- the modern idea of liberty in the person. Um, And I don't think you have to have a super rationalistic or atomistic idea of the person to achieve this result. I think it's a it's I think it's a thin, thinner idea than that. But that's kind of the problem to me is that is it is a thin idea. And the actually existing liberalism, when they're what that thin idea does when it confronts the world is confronts a lot of contradictions. And I worry about the posit that like liberalism, uh, liberal socialism would just rescue the thin idea and flatten those contradictions. And maybe it would, but it doesn't seem like some of the challenges in dealing with liberal ideology seem to just kind of too easy. That's what I said, like, I'm a little, I'm worried that it's too easy. Just like get rid of the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. But like, 
liberalism, I think, as Ben is saying, has a spectrum. There are liberal liberals. Okay, there are radical liberalism. And today I, I'm writing most recently in my book that there is a paradigm of radical liberalism at this time. Um, or liberalism that is including all the things that is previously excluded. And yet it continues to defend capitalism, private property, and inequalities, so long as they aren't the arbitrary kind by race, gender, sexuality, and so on. Um, then there's liberal conservatism, where they are liberals, but they always just want to defend whatever hierarchies exist currently, even if they won't defend the ones of the past. Um, so these ideological wings are, are in some tension um, and they clash within existing liberal institutions. And that, and so I think that that's also for me, like what's not so helpful about the current fascism discourse is like, the, the right of liberalism is actually committed to bourgeois democracy in a certain way. And that makes it uh, distinct and liberal, but right wing. And how socialists relate to this, um, I just, like when Matt was talking about being like the other man in the romance between liberalism and capitalism, I just wonder if that is like how useful it is to still call that um, liberalism in a thick sense, as opposed to in the thin sense, like, in a, in a thick sense, what you have to do from that position is undermine the basic commitments to justifying really like inequality um, that exists within that liberal spectrum. And you try, you're trying to rescue the thin moral commitments over and against the thick ones, um, which have to do with private property, merit, and all of these like liberal concepts. And so it's just not clear to me that like, doubling down on like it's it's one thing to double down on the morals of what you the rational kernel inside what, what marx would call it um but given that like one is uh contesting with a series of contradictions um where inequality exists and liberalism has this way of negotiating inequality it just strikes me that that's actually like a third that's not um it's there's something else that's happening there that isn't just vindicating liberalism. Um, it's pushing against the uh, social form in which liberalism is a contradictory result. Um, and so like, yeah. Would I be able to respond to that? Yeah, no, I, I take both of what you're saying on board. And I think, again, we need to be careful in qualitatively demarcating the spectrum uh, of both liberal thought and liberal ideology on these points, right? Uh, so, for instance, I think that you really see the jumping off point in all these disputes uh, in the Wollstonecraft Burke debate, right? Uh, where Mary Wollstonecraft famously criticized Edmund Burke, uh, who's usually considered to be a kind of right wing liberal, uh, for defending property and defending inequality. And Burke fires back saying that there's the sublime Gothic compact set by God. Uh, which you cannot change. Uh, and it basically says that the king is supposed to be in his palace forever and you're all just supposed to deal with it. That's me being, you know, mean, but I don't really particularly like Burke. So we'll just settle with that. I think that there are many liberals out there. Uh, and I think this has been the reigning ideology for a very long time, particularly under neoliberal conditions, uh, who are effectively just conservatives, right? Uh, where they innovate upon the conservative tradition uh, is, again, this model of hierarchical complementarity that earlier conservatives were attracted to was comparably static and set by God or nature or some combination of the two. And you still see plenty of people like Jordan Peterson appeal to iterations of that today let alone many fascists, right, who tend to understand this genetically, right? Uh, conservative liberals tend to see this as too fluffy uh, and too sublime uh, concept of inequality, right, and hierarchy. Uh, and they tend to see the market as something akin to a competitive Darwinian mechanism to allocate to individuals the actual status that they deserve uh, and to put constant pressure on them to conform uh, to the dictates of market society and its tyrannical necessities. Uh, and when you understand that flavor of liberalism, then absolutely, I think you have to grasp uh, the emergence of something like postmodern conservatism as flowing from a certain kind of liberal contradiction. Think about somebody like Trump, right? Uh, many liberals have been very critical of Donald Trump, uh, but he's a neoliberal par excellence. And I think Wendy Brown makes that very clear, right? He sees the world in terms of so-called winners and so-called losers. Uh, you're supposed to compete up to the top to be a winner. Uh, and if you don't, then people at the top owe nothing to you. Right. Uh, and I need to think we need to be emphatically uh, willing to reject that flavor of possessive individualist competitive liberalism. That's really no better than conservatism. And that's always going to be attractive to the ruling elite. 
right? Uh, in terms, though, of my theoretical ambitions, I think that it's a little bit misleading uh, to suggest that there hasn't been a very radical dimension to liberalism from the very beginning. I often point out that it's really telling that the two most important liberal theorists of both the 19th and 20th century both identified with socialism uh, near the end of their careers, right? John Stuart Mills and John Rawls. And I think that's because they recognized that a deep commitment to human equality and human freedom uh, was fundamentally incompatible with markets, right? Uh, or at least with capitalist markets. There might be an argument for something like market socialism that I know Lillian is herself actually a little bit interested in, right? Uh, and how it is that we can go about rescuing, to use the term, uh, this more emancipatory, egalitarian dimension of liberalism and carrying it into a socialist future, that's something that I think is an ongoing project for people like me. But I think Mill and Rawls and people like Chantal Mouffe give us a lot of clues, right, about how to carry on dialectically the most important aspects of liberalism without engendering similar contradictions to what we see in a liberal, neoliberal context. Uh, one of the things that I think liberals need to do that Rawls was already beginning to do uh, is be more attentive to the potential of economic domination. Uh, and this is why Rawls in his later work, for instance, doesn't just talk about the difference principle, but about getting equal value from political liberties, uh, which has a nice kind of Republican ring to it. But I think that even somebody like John Stuart Mills, where he talks about countervailing centers of power uh, within liberal society, set uh, by allowing people to form worker communes uh, to prevent concentrations of class power is a very, very important point, right? And I can go into more detail about that. I think I'll just leave it at that, though. This is left-wing kind of liberalism uh, is what it is that I want to carry forward into the future. Uh, and I think there are ways of doing so that keep what's the rational kernel, as you put it, of liberalism, carry it forward into a democratic socialist future uh, while abandoning the features of liberalism that ultimately result in contradictions, particularly this kind of possessive individualist competitive approach to liberalism uh, that essentially is just a kind of conservatism with all the kind of idealism forms of reification that are associated with that. Yeah. So uh, that might actually be a good way to bring back up some of what Lillian was saying earlier, because, um, you know, when you're talking about the, uh, so, uh, you know, I guess two of the three most important jobs in the history of liberalism uh, becoming. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Who's the third then? Locke. Oh, fuck. Yeah. How could I forget that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Wait, wow, that was were a the moment. first two? I was thinking Locke and Rawls. I, I think I might have. Uh, John Stuart Mill is the middle, is, oh, the, yeah. is the middle John there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I like those, those, you know, the two of those Johns, uh, you know, becoming, you know, uh, socialists or being interested in socialism. You know, there's, there's a, there's a, book that got a lot of attention a couple of years ago called John Rawls Reticiat Socialist. Um, he, you know, he was like a little bit ambiguous about it, but I mean, like he definitely moved in that direction, you know, in, uh, in the end with justice and fairness and restatement. And um, in fact, I think last time Matt was on the show was to talk about uh, John Stuart Mill and, uh, and socialism, but you can kind of, you know, there's, I can there's just a interject one second. I wanted to yeah. say, I forgot to make this point. It is actually really refreshing to be on this show, Ben, and actually talk about something that I am enjoying. Because usually I'm like, get message being like, let's talk Curtis Yarver, or let's talk Alexander Dugan. So sitting there and being able I was, to I was, really I was nice. literally going to ask you to, uh, meaning to ask you to come back on to uh, to do a Yarvin follow-up. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that might actually happen in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, um, so, <clears throat> okay, uh so there is a way, right, that somebody who, uh, you know, who who agreed with a lot of things that have been said, who who like, uh, could take that on board, right? But still say, yeah, but like, uh, let's liberalism is still counterposed to what I want. In other words, that uh, could say, okay, sure, maybe there's like some form of socialism that's compatible with liberalism. Maybe even there are certain kinds of liberal ideals that, if you take them seriously enough. You uh, you end up actually being being sort of quartered into mm -hmm. uh, socialist conclusions, but you could still say, uh, you know, I mean, I guess just to put it, you know, crassly, like even if, you know, liberalism might be compatible with socialism, but it's not compatible with Marxist socialism, right? In other words, that you could you could say, and, and this is there's like a version of this critique that sounds a lot like some of what Lily was saying earlier, even though I don't know that she would make that, you know quite like this considering some of the other things she said but like you could uh 
you could say, yeah, sure. I mean, you could be something like a, you know, a, uh, you know, petty bourgeois utopian socialist and think that the, uh, you know, and think that we have certain moral ideals and, and we're going to demand that, you know, that reality, you know, come into conformity with them. And, you know, you can end up being a kind of socialist that way. But if we're, but if we're interested in socialism that emerges from a historical process, that's, uh, um, that, uh, like is not you know we're we're interested in you know in, in finding possibilities that are already contained in the you know with in the present and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. then like that's uh liberalism is is going to be massively un, unhelpful to that right so like a um so so like a more like an extreme version of this view is that not only liberalism but uh but but any talk about like sort of abstract views about justice uh, whether whether those views are liberal or or otherwise, right? You know, is is uh, um, is sort of the, this there's something sort of suspect or unmaterialist about that, um, and I know Lily wouldn't endorse that because the the last thing she she had a Jacobin was like I think literally called like socialists should talk more about justice, uh, and was all about you know how we should uh, how we should uh, uh, it is actually important for us to talk about you know. To, to theorize about what would count as just society and why it would count as just society. And that is actually something that, uh, that is actually something that socialists should, uh, socialists should be, should be interested in doing. Right. And so, uh, so even though that kind of critique, you know, critique I just sketched out or maybe caricatured a little bit, but I, th I think that's more or less accurate to what a lot of people would say, um, you know, presumably goes further than Lillian's position, but some of the stuff she said earlier about norms uh, that, you know, well, norms are socially constituted anyway, we're, we're, we're doing, uh, you know, the, the way we should criticize capitalism is like imminent critique, but kind of, um, you know, like we'll just have differently constituted norms in the socialist future anyway. Like some of it I think does in some ways come close to that. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to shut up and uh, and turn it back over to uh, to Lillian. I should also say, I uh, saw so we have a super chat. We'll we'll uh, we'll uh, uh, bring that up in a few minutes. But also, if anybody else has questions that they'd like to uh, to ask Lillian or Matt, uh, just uh, drop them in the chat, and maybe you know, 15 minutes, we'll we'll address some of those. So, my I'll just maybe try to be sort of quick because I'm realizing that one of my biggest problems here is the relationship between the, the the norms that we're talking about that are desirable and liberalism as an ideology. And um, I think that, that Ben is right, that this is like the source of my ambivalence. I do think it's worthwhile to talk about justice, mostly because without it, I'm not sure how to think about the future um, in a way that isn't just reproducing the current existing sense of doom. And I do think that um, earlier generations of socialists didn't have such a pro there was there was often a lot of romance to, to like the old left and um, I and and the new left, I think less romance, but quite a bit of it. And I think that um, the intervention that like scientific socialism makes is lie over and against the romance and the utopian socialism, and so this is the, the Marxist point, is that it, it interrogates the normative expectations that people have and whether or not they can become reflective of themselves and their own conditions. And what I am somewhat skeptical of this is because it seems like the, the, the ideological problem is that rel there is relative equality within the market. And so people endorse a certain sense of equality. And then in, in, co in confronting the contradictions of inequality, they tend to adapt that norm of equality in very inegalitarian ways. So like recently we did an episode on what's left of philosophy where it was like, we talked about policing and liberalism. When you have laws that are supposed to treat people equally and in under conditions of inequality, it seems like a social fact that those laws get enforced unequally. Um, and when you have these kinds of normative expectations under conditions of relative equality within the market, 
but the dominant compulsions of the system are toward market competition, then people start to discriminate. And they, they and I don't mean that in the, I, I mean it more abstractly than when people usually think about discrimination. People usually think about discrimination by race, gender, and sexuality. Um, I mean, like people, there is a there is a material reason why under conditions of equality, a person can start to discriminate. And that can become a historical trend because expectations of inequality turn into their opposite when people confront the contradiction that is private property and capital accumulation. So my question is whether or not liberal norms themselves, like positing liberal standards of justice, is sufficient to become self-reflective about this condition. And I think Matt's position is that it can be. And I just am more reserved about this because all of the existing attempts that I can see don't really seem to do that very well. So like, you know, I'm thinking about even the reticent socialist stuff, like Rawls doesn't endorse socialism. He endorse, endorses like property owning democracy and like, fine, you admit capitalism is unjust, but then it's like, what do we do there? And then you end up positing these like kind of, ab, you know, then you, then you get into the kind of utopian trap where it's like, where, like, how can I create a, a thought experiment of a society in which these norms start, like I can flatten these contradictions. Um, and, and so like, that's, and, and then I'm just not sure how useful that is because in the present, like when you start looking at the contradictions themselves, they, uh, the, the discriminating tendencies tend to take priority. So I think that's where my methodological question is, is that like, to me, the de defining feature of really existing liberalism is the defense of private property. Concepts like just desert, merit and entitlement and discriminating over those relative and counterintuitively relative to this, these norms of relative equality and the conditions of it. So like people like uh, all the people, Locke, obviously, John Stuart Mill, also, obviously, John Rawls, you can push him as far as you want. It wasn't, you know, th then he, then we have these methodological questions. So it's like once put liberalism is pushed to its limit and you admit capitalism is bad, um, what to do about it? Then you're in utopian socialism territory. And like, I don't know, like it's, it's not, like altogether wrong to me it just also doesn't seem to like there's something uh there there's something like uh l not methodologically satisfying to me about that about Lism's capacity to become reflective of its own conditions and it tends to be to me like a challenge to liberalism almost from, not from the outside, but for, like it tends to be a subterranean challenge to liberalism that forces it to become self-reflective. So like, um, you know, think, debates about civil disobedience, debates about um, like turning political rights into social rights. These are things that like move, you know, movements from below forced liberalism to do. And it wasn't liberalism's own reflective capacities from the top down. So that's why I think like the imminent critique is important because it's usually in the contestation that these things emerge, um, which isn't non-liberalism. It's just not like, it's not like Kantian, I guess. I think it is more Hegelian. Yeah, I would say in a certain respect, um, although I would argue that there is a lineage there in terms of the history of transcendental idealism. And again, seeing society as a fabrication that can be reoriented by human will, which ultimately has its roots in people like Locke or and, uh, Hobbes, for example. But putting that all aside, I agree with a lot of what it is that you're saying. I think that we absolutely need to be imminently critical of actually existing liberalism, particularly in its more right wing forms. Uh, and, you know, I've tried to make my contribution to that by bringing up people like Charles Mill or writing a book on mm -hmm. a critical legal examination of liberalism and liberal rights was my kind of major statement on this. Uh, but in terms of the kind of Marx connection, I do agree that there's something methodologically unsatisfying about trying to conciliate this tradition uh, with liberal bourgeois approaches to justice. Uh, and it's an ongoing project on my part to try to be able to enact such a synthesis. But I will say that I think that part of that is going to mean that we're going to need to carve out elements of both liberalism and its theoretical dispositions and Marxism. So for instance, uh, I think Cohen is right that Marxism made very, very good points in establishing that right can only be as high as the mode of production that exists at any given time. That means that many people are going to have to negotiate within the boundaries of actually existing liberalism for emancipatory conditions until things ultimately transition to a higher mode of production, uh, at what point we can have a higher form of justice, right? Uh, 
I think, though, that the problem with this approach is that there was a residual element of teleology baked into at least vulgar Marxism. Uh, and Cohen talks a lot about this in his own work, right? That presumed that ultimately the inner contradictions of capitalism would lead to its collapse uh, and its replacement by a society where the expropriators would be expropriated and the free development of each would be the condition for the free development of all. I think that there's really no faith left except on very, very fringe elements of the left in this kind of dialectic of history, uh, which means we need to turn back to normative theory in the way that Cohen is talking about in order to try to advance the kind of causes that Marx was talking about within the parameters of actually existent society. And there an imminent critique of liberalism can be extremely helpful, right? In terms of what I think liberalism needs to cede to Marxism, uh, I think that we've already seen a little bit of movement on that on the part of people like Rawls, uh, not enough, right? Uh, but what it needs to do is abandon its commitment to a kind of methodological individualism, or certainly a normative individualism, uh, that sees society as just the creation of self-interested actors and nothing more. Uh, I think that we need to understand that society is invariably riven with extraordinary power dynamics and forms of domination. This includes economic domination. Uh, and a proper approach to liberal justice not only takes those seriously, but puts extraordinary amounts of pressure on them in the names of uh, in the name of equality and freedom. And I do think, uh, just to go back to my boy Rawls for a second, he does accomplish something uh, to this effect. So, for instance, in his lectures on political philosophy, he points out that Marx was a heroic figure. That's his term, not mine. Uh, and one of the reasons he was a heroic figure is that he made the state or social institutions the first subject of justice. Uh, Marx wouldn't use the term justice, of course, but he says that's what he's doing. And Moral says that's exactly what I'm trying to do by taking uh, social institutions and the state as the first subject of my theory of justice, not the atomic individual and their self-interested kind of motivations. So that's a big improvement. And I think you see that reflected in his kind of liberal socialist or property-only democracy approach to understanding what's required by justice as fairness, for example. Uh, again, he emphasizes the importance of fair equality, or sorry, uh, equal value for political liberties, which is, is a big advance. Uh, he emphasizes things like the need to be attentive to the least well off in a way that earlier liberals wouldn't. So there's been progress there. Uh, I think that we need a lot more. Uh, and I think that there are some very interesting scholars that are doing that. People like Charles Mill, who just passed away recently, uh, or Roberto Unger, uh, who I saw was in the super chat, who characterized... Well, we'll, we'll get to him, but the... Uh, I, I, I do... Um, you know, for the record, uh, I think my my memory of, of the Rawls thing about property and democracy is a little bit different, I think, from what either Matt or Lilia just, just said. He, he like, says that it could be justice and fairness could lead to either property owning democracy or liberal socialism. And then he's fucking annoyingly agnostic about it, uh, which is where the whole admission stuff comes in, right? Whereas, like, he shouldn't be agnostic on it. Clearly, liberal socialism is what he should be committed to. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that he. I, I mean, there is a way, though. I mean, like, because you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned a minute ago uh, Marx's comment and critique of the Gotha program about uh, about uh, how right can't be higher, you know, than, than what's supported by you know the uh, level development of forced production in a society. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, G.A. Cohen, if you read his essay on uh, Isaiah Berlin, and uh, it's it's like the first at the beginning of finding oneself and the other uh, if you have that book is um you know like he makes this comment in passing uh that that i think is really sharp about that that it's like really interesting that that line is often quoted as sort of evidence of marx thinking that you can't you know sort of apply general standards to considering a variety mm -hmm. of different societies and you know which one's more desirable uh when uh when actually what that shows is exactly that marx does think that right in other words yeah. they have a uh, that like it only makes sense, right? If there's a standard by which we can evaluate higher and lower, right? On the standard, right? That they have, have like, even though, you know, we're living under capitalism, we can, we could talk about, you know, the, uh, you know, like, like, a, like a higher, higher form of right, you know, existing and then an even higher one after that in advanced communism. Um, and, and I think there is a way of, you know, I, I mean, I guess just to just to quickly lay a couple of cards, some of my own cards on the table before I go back to Lillian. I mean, like, I think on, you know, there are a few different issues here, right? One is about sort of um, how much should the left care about certain kinds of liberal norms? And there, I think we might have boring unanimity. I think I think all three of us probably think, you know, quite a bit, right? Uh, that they're like... Throw them all in jail. That's what I say, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like that civil liberties are really important and, you know, and, and there are, uh, 
uh, et cetera, right? Like, I think I think everybody agrees with that, right? So that's that's one question. Then, like, another question is sort of historical analysis of, like, liberalism as a phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. And there, there, you know, probably are some, some disagreements there. And then a third question is about how to think about normative ideals of, of any kind, right? That the, uh, like, this is sort of roughly the scientific versus utopian socialism question. Uh, so... As I said, just to quickly lay a couple of my cards on table on the that last one, right? I mean, my you know my view on that. I mean, and like kind of my uh, you know critique of you know maybe some of what Lillian was laid out earlier, although whether or not it's ultimately incompatible, I'm not sure. Right? Is is just something like this that okay? Sure, uh, it is plausible that you know that our normative beliefs are going to be different from you know, those of our descendants living in advanced socialist societies. I have no problem with that. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, honestly, I'm not that much of a moral realist. I don't really think that there are, you know, moral facts hanging from the sky, you know, waiting for us to, uh, to, to discover them. Right. I think that what we're doing when we do normative philosophy is we're, is we're roughly, you know, Whatever our deepest intuitions are about this stuff, wherever they come from, which is an empirical question that has really, as far as I'm concerned, little to nothing to do with what we're doing when we when we make normative arguments, um, you know, we're just trying to bring those intuitions into some kind of reflective equilibrium and to hammer them into a consistent picture. That would be, you know, that'd be my view on that. Uh, and so, you know, if if my, you know, great, great, great grandchildren have different intuitions that that's for them to, you know, so they're, they're going to care about different things than I do. And that's, that's interesting. That's interesting knowledge, but it has little to nothing to do with what I, you know, what I think, uh, I think right now, right. Like what I'm just, what I'm trying to do, figure out when I do normative reflection is to figure out what I care about and to convince other people to care about the same things, and you know, and all that. And so, uh, so I think that, um, you know, this, this issue about imminent critique, um, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this kind of a simple minded objection, but I mean, it's clearly not entirely true that we're judging a society by its own standards because, um, you know, like we, some of the official standards of the society, we, we accept and we use to judge it. And some of them we reject, right? I mean, like that, that's, uh, nobody's, you know, bourgeois democratic revolutionaries weren't, uh, you know, were criticizing feudalism because, you know, because it didn't, it didn't honor the principle of divine right of kings in the right way, right? You know, they just, they just rejected the principle. You know, maybe you could argue that there are sort of deeper, more abstract principles, you know, about feudalism that were still being, you know, assumed. But like, it's, you know, we're we're clearly in the in the business of picking and choosing which of the, you know, which of the standards of the existing society we're using to, to judge it. And I think that, you know, that's just the sort of business of moral reflection of, you know, making normative arguments, you know, is, is to like try to convince people not to care about some of those standards and to care about some of them and whatever. But like, I, it, it seems to me that what, you know, scientific socialism, you know, what I would see is the distinction between, you know, that at least in the most defensible use of the phrase and utopian socialism is that, you know, utopian socialism, there's a sort of like, okay, we figure out what a just society would be. And then we sort of do that in a kind of like year zero scrap, scrap the status quo and start over kind of way. Right. Whereas in, uh, scientific socialism, we say, well, there are certain possibilities contained within the the present and, you know, and you, you're not making history under conditions of your own choosing. Uh, you have, uh, that they're, you know, that like, yeah, sure. The, you know, uh, right. Can't, you know, can't get higher, you know, the mode of production could, could support. Right. So it's like our, our ability to, our ability to realize the stuff that we care about is going to depend on, on the particular, you know, historical circumstances, in which we, you know, we find ourselves, I mean, I think scientific socialism is science in the engineering sense. Like it tells us how to like, how we can accomplish our goals to the extent that we can accomplish them. Uh, but you know, what the, the goals are seems like a very separate question to me. And I realize as I'm saying that, that I have, um, that I talked for way longer than I was planning to. So, uh, let's, let's go. Can let's, I ask you, ask uh, Lillian a question? Would that be possible? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, just before that, I want to say though, possible that, and I uh, suspect actual. Yes, go on. Good. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say, uh, in terms of you know history and norms changing, uh, Ben and I have a lot of debates about music, and I still stand on the principle that history will ultimately vindicate me, and future generations will look back on my taste as the right one, uh, not yours. But what is your uh, what is your taste? Basically, any like post punk thing. Uh, yeah, Joy Division was the last oh, band, okay. best band, and everything. You know. So, so we had a very long argument in Mexico City very a few long. years ago about, uh, um, I think it going through two or three bars about uh, the Stones yeah. versus the Beatles. So I think that's what I think that's maybe I I initially thought that's what Matt thought. Uh, you know, history was going to vindicate him on. Oh, but, I still stand by that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, no, no. Uh, well. Just on a more serious point, um, I really enjoyed your essay on socialist justice, Lillian. I thought it was just fantastic. And you know, I tried, you know, basically I sent it to everyone I possibly could because I was like, this is exactly the kind of thinking I think we need right now. So I kind of wanted to ask you just in the spirit of that, uh, what would you say then are the abstract norms that you, we should carry on from liberalism? And where do you think socialist norms would look a little bit different in a socialist theory of justice? Uh, and maybe that could be a way of enacting a little bit of a conciliation as we move towards like the end of this discussion. And by the way, I want to emphasize, I think it's a great essay. So, you know, I hope a lot of people read it. So I, I think that the, what would change has to do with the kind, it has to do with the kind of thing that the norms are reflecting on. And so I suppose I, I don't think I, I agree with Ben that we're in the business of picking and choosing. Um, I, th I think that normally the norms that exist are the ones that are, uh, they are responses to ways of problem solving in, in the world and as long and I and I just take this to be the materialist point that as long as those problems are there the norms that are germane, germane to them um, the expectations people have and how people think they fail or succeed vis-a-vis -vis problems like and I take problems to be like material problems things you're trying to change or adapt or or whatever um, that those are like the, the what we are reflecting on and I don't think we're picking and choosing. I think we tend to we we tend to either um, adapt or transform what exists. And you might make an argument that a concept as such is just incoherent, but I don't think it's ever like that straightforwardly. So, um, so like I don't think that what was going on during the Enlightenment is. Like we are just gonna choose some things and get rid of others. Like as far as I'm, I, I can see, like pre-modern political philosophy doesn't straightforwardly reject the divine right of kings as such. It 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 makes it compatible with early liberal and republican ideals, and then changes in society create the conditions under which people start to say this is incoherent as such. And so, like I don't think that those norms are ever coming from the out outside and and so my my question about whether or not uh so so anyway to answer your question i think like the things that are valuable are indeed equality but the way that we or, or moral equality or uh non-discrimination and these kinds of things the, the problem is, is that the way, the shape of those norms relative to the existing structure is currently not, uh, not good. Okay. So like, I think that, um, saying that these norms are contradictory or, or incoherent in the present means saying that they have to be something different in the future. So like, and, and I think a, a lot about Charles Mills actually in relation to this question um, because he does this kind of critique and rescue of say, um, I don't know, distributive justice. So instead of distributive justice, we need to have corrective justice. Okay. Like, I think this is a very provocative thing to do. I also think that it, is consistent with the fact that he gives up on uh, anti-capitalism long before that happens. 
So the transformation of distributive justice into corrective justice is addressing a problem of discrimination and historical uh, inequality. But that idea, corrective justice is not like, to me, I, that that is accepting the current way of distributing things and then justifying correction within it. And uh, that's, you know, a, a kind of shift to the kind of radical liberalism I was talking about before. Um, but it's not making an argument for like social equ socialist equality as such. And you can say that he needs to, that if you want to make, you know, if you want racial equality, you also need class inequality or class equality. But the problem is, is that class equality isn't possible because the existence of class as such makes that impossible. So there is something like, just like jarring to me about being like, yeah, we need to rescue distributive justice, turn it into corrective justice. Like to me, like the idea of distributive justice, uh, that, that transformation seems to be the product of the social form that is being reflected on. So would we still have a concept of distributive justice under socialism? Yeah, but it would probably like lack those kinds of arguments about who deserves what and who is entitled to what and like who like we would have a much stronger idea of um uh social uh i don't know if i would call it social rights i suppose but like citizenship rights would be more uh, tied to equality of material conditions like rights of citizenship whereas like currently they are not. So I can I can grant that like they will become like that some of those concepts could remain that we're not gonna like pull new con concepts out of thin air. But to me, like Charles Mills is actually kind of a cautionary tale. Like you want to make ra liberalism radical, lo and behold, you end up like with a very re almost restrictive sense of what is to be done about racial justice in the United States. Like I like that's kind of my my view about that. It's not amb ambitious enough and therefore it has a status quo bias. So like that's to me, that's like an example of my worry about the conservative nature of like adapting liberal norm, like just, yeah, I don't know. No, I wanted to say, I completely agree with you in your critique of Charles Mill, right? Uh, what I was referring to more as the advantageous part of his theory is more his critique of uh, ideal theory, right? And the fact oh, that it's divorced that. from the reality of power, history, that kind of thing, which I do think is a materialist point, right? But in terms of corrective versus distributive justice and what that entails, uh, I agree that there's a kind of melancholic quality to his resignation in his later work that I would reject personally, right? As kind of too dour, uh, although he deserved his melancholy, right? Living through the neoliberal era and Reagan and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. In, in yeah, terms I of say that, like, because I was, I was unsympathetic. I just, it's, a, it's a reflection of a historical moment whose limits I, I don't think. It's the end of the end of history, you know. Like, it's the end yeah. of history, and now we're at the end of the end of history, and so the concepts that seemed possible at that time were much more re restricted. Um, and I, I think it's like when, when one just says, "Okay, I'm going to be a liberal now," it just strikes me that one ends up. In endorsing the limits of one's per period as opposed to the contrary. So another example, and I'm sorry I interrupted you and I'll let you, but like another example is like Tommy Shelby, who I think is awesome. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, and actually I think I, I prefer um, over the, the Charles Mills's ap approach, but he says that like, you know, socialist equality is not what is demanded by justice. And then you make arguments about reciprocity and um, like, uh, other kinds of issues with the relationship that Black Americans have with the American political system. But you start off by talking about that by saying the kind of equality I don't mean is socialist equality. Like, that's like, I keep, inter that seems to me to be like what liberal, what happens to, to liberalism um, when it tries to become self reflective. It can it starts to become trapped in the limits of the possible, like in a very pragmatist, in the negative pejorative sense, pragmatist way. Sure. I mean, if I could respond to that. Yeah, sorry. I interrupted you. Fine. Yeah, no, that's not a problem, right? Uh, I'm glad that we clarified that point, right? Uh, again, I think that 
right-wing liberalism, which is always amenable to existing power structures, uh, very much falls into the trap that you're talking about of transforming very readily into, let's just use the Fisher term, a kind of capitalist realism that insists there is no alternative. Uh, and I'm a millennial like you. Uh, I think that's bullshit. You know, I think that, you know, we definitely have alternatives and we need to theorize about them, right? Uh, however, just from my own standpoint, I want to make clear that uh, I'm an unapologetic liberal socialist, uh, and both of those elements are important to me. I don't regard this as a kind of resignation on my part, because I genuinely think that there are substantive elements of the liberal tradition that need to be carried on if we're going to have a just society, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I would argue from a kind of Rawlsian perspective is that I do think that Rawls is attentive uh, to many of the concerns that you're talking about. Uh, you won't find a more substantive critique of meritocratic ideals than what you discover in his work, since he goes even further in some senses, I would argue, than Marx in saying it's not just a matter of domination or power. Uh, it's the fact that there never will be a meritocracy, right? It's a kind of mythological ideal uh, that constitutes a kind of secularized theology that we need to wean ourselves off of in order to be rational. Uh, and like Rawls, I think that a liberal socialist society would permit certain kinds of inequities if they work to the benefit of the least well off. I don't think that any kind of resentment driven leveling uh, that brings everyone down to exactly the same point, regardless of the consequences, what any egalitarian would want. Uh, what kind of inequalities could be permissible to benefit the least well off? I think it's far less inequality than what we see right now, vastly less inequality than what we see right now. And I think assessing neoliberal society from that standpoint, it's transparent how profoundly illiberal uh, it's anti-socialist uh, and unjust it is along all those metrics, right? Uh, now, in terms of how it is that, you know, we could properly transition to something that's a little bit more on the bright side of things. Uh, I think what you mentioned in your lecture, for example, about liberalism and a plurality of values under socialist conditions really is a good way of starting to argue for the kind of things that I think we're all interested in. So you bring up the fact that Liberals are very concerned that people live a kind of good life that accords with their choice, for example, right? Uh, and then you bring up the fact that this is something that a lot of millennials suffer from, right? If you want to have kids under the conditions of neoliberal capitalism, that might be a very difficult thing because it's prohibitively expensive to do so. I know a lot of my friends were in that position, right? And we can argue that a socialist society would expand the array of freedoms that you happen to have precisely because it would give you the resources that you need in order to make those kind of choices and to have them actually be choices rather than things that are imposed upon you by what Marx called the kind of tyranny of necessity, right? I think the example you gave of uh, seniors' homes uh, is also another good one. You know, I volunteered there for a long time, and just like you, uh, a lot of seniors I know live really, really crappy lives uh, because they got nothing from the state. Uh, which saw them as a burden, uh, non-contributing members of society, and just shuffled them into these places saying, you know, go die as quickly as you can, right? I think that giving them resources would open up new trains of freedom for them uh, and potentially even allow them to live longer to enjoy those kinds of freedoms, right? Uh, so these are the kinds of questions I think that liberal socialists should be asking about, how to reconcile a liberal concern with a pluralism of values and a pluralism of views about the good life with uh, an argument for material equality and the way that could expand various forms of freedom. So can I add something and then maybe we could see if there's any questions in the chat? I mean, whatever Ben wants to do, because I, I think that's that's right. Um, I think I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, my reservations have to do with how people think about um, private property and the kind of compulsions in which that it makes Me too. Yeah. the way that people interpret liberal norms. And so the thing that I have done not because I, I really disagree that like there is a certain expansion and save and rescue that can happen. I think um, that much I agree with. It seems that the core of the kernel of my uh, methodological problem is contesting and contending with private property, given the ongoing compulsions in the social structure throughout history to interpret these norms in very diminished and contradictory ways. And I worry that the ideology itself, like, there, there. I, I'm. I, I think I'm still not convinced that like the norms themselves. Like you can push against it, but it seems like uh, pre the existence of like the kind of historical necessity of interpreting these norms vis-a-vis -vis private property tends to not generate the results that you're talking about. And the thing, the thing that I have started to wonder, and the reason I've kind of I've turned to a Republican view is both because I think this is a tradition that existed prior to capitalism as an egalitarian tradition, um, also with its own contradictions, but also in the transition to it, 
that is not uh, that has kind of become an interesting contender to how to think about freedom. And one of the in it, it has given me better language than I think liberalism has for being able to talk about what's wrong with these structural compulsions that create this impoverished and contradictory view of the liberal norms that I might otherwise find desirable. And I've always wondered, like, is my real issue that I think that the norms that Rawls talks about are not, they, they, are, uh, they are too amenable to interpretation within this structure that I'm worried about this, uh, like the capacity for auto critique and the way these norms become discriminating in real political time. And then the zero sum race to the bottom that seems to be emerging under neoliberalism. The Republican view kind of helps me because it helps me put a language, a language of freedom in contrast to domination that surrounds those structural constraints. So it starts to see like what kind of shape do liberal norms have to have? Um, and can it, and it seems to me like official, like liberalism as an ideology might not be enough to actually protect liberal norms. Um, a stronger idea of freedom, what it means to live in a free society might be a better way of kind of framing those norms. Like, so what we start to think about is not liberal norms relative to capitalism, but liberal norms interpreted through the lens of what it would mean to live under conditions of non, like non-domination. So, um, and then we can start to think, okay, so if we have different kind of dominant compulsions, a different, uh, um, different laws of motion, then what would these norms start to look like? Then what would pluralism be? Then, so it, for some reason, I, I, and I have to think about this a little bit more, I just haven't found liberalism as useful for articulating what is the problem with capitalism specifically, like because of its impersonal nature, because of the relative equality, because of the contradictions and thinking under about equality under those conditions and its ideological effects, to me, it's like the stair is quite high to climb for liberalism, but the la the Republican language seems to like capture it almost right away. And then I can start rethinking liberal norms like within. So I think that's kind of my where my project might be going. If I could yeah. just make uh, one quick comment real about quick. that. Yeah, real quick. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I mean, I talked earlier about being in a love triangle with, you know, liberalism, capitalism, mm -hmm. and then me. Uh, recently, because Sean Gooday gave me the Republican literature, I now feel like I'm in a love square where like there's this new Republican tradition out there that I don't know too well, but I'm kind of like tantalized by it. So definitely, I think there's a lot of potential. There. Yeah, that that seems it. like I think at that point, God just abandoned the love triangle thing. Yeah, I'm really gonna <laughs> metaphor and, and, and say that you just you just want to have a poly relationship with uh, liberalism. <laughs> I want to. I'm a Hegelian, you know, maybe at heart. I want to have it all, you know. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean. I, I think that that last point about republicanism is is really interesting, and um, I will just say, going to have to try to get, you know, Lillian back at some point to just to just go deeper on this question about utopian socialism and and, and imminent critique and the extent to which we are uh, the sense in which we are picking and choosing versus the sense in which, you know, the, the options that we have to pick and choose from, you know, are, are constrained historically, or that's just not the right way to think about what we're doing. Uh, Cause that's an incredibly interesting discussion and I'm super tempted to go back to it, but also, um, also uh, we, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are running towards the end, and I want to I want to give you guys a chance to take several questions, and and like that could that could easily be an hour right now if we uh, if we go back to that. So uh, we'll have to put a pin in that part. Uh, but I do want to just actually just just give sort of you know I mean lightning round both of you just like real on this republicanism question, right? So because um, you know the sort of first time I kind of encountered the idea that's like oh. Um, you know, we should be thinking of freedom primarily in terms of non-domination rather than non-interference. My immediate reaction was yes, obviously, right? I mean, that's that's definitely right. You know, that um, I mean, I, I think one way to to think about um, you know the socialist project is is that it sort of takes you know, like you know, it, in some ways, it's it's maybe what you get if you if you marry. You know, because like the classical Republican theorists, 
you know, and uh, antiquity, you know, thought that like this was something that was only possible for some people to be free in this way. If, if not, everybody was, you know, that they, you know, you, you, you need a class of slaves to, uh, to, to be doing the, the work so that, you know, so that your, your citizens can, can be exercising this, you know, this Republican, uh, you know, they, they're sort of freed up to exercise this Republican freedom. Right. You know, this, so one way of thinking, you know, about Republicanism is that it, it's uh, some, one way of thinking about socialism is that, you know, is, is that you sort of, if you, take seriously given a certain set of economic conditions uh what it would mean to have meaningful freedom from domination but also marry that to enlightenment moral universalism right you know then you then you end up with what socialists care about so um i I wonder you know just just in a kind of light in round way what you would both think of that well, I think that there are four concepts of freedom, uh, all of which have their independent virtues and all of which have their defects. And I think to articulate the Berlinian point about wanting a pluralism of values, the best kind of society is going to maximize uh, all forms of uh, all four forms of freedom, although what the balance should be is contestable. Right. Uh, I think the liberal tradition really tends to foreground negative freedom from non-interference, you know, this idea of non-interference, uh, particularly physical non-interference. Uh, and I think there's definitely value to that. Although, like Lillian, I share reservations about the idea of property rights uh, being central to a truly egalitarian and really authentic kind of liberalism, right? Uh, the second kind of freedom that I think is important is uh, freedom of human capabilities, right? Uh, this idea that I am more free if the array of options available to me are expanded, particularly materially. Uh, and a good way of positing this point is if you were on a desert island, um, yeah, you might have no one negatively interfering with your freedom. You might even be socially free, but most people would consider that a prison because the options available to them are highly limited. And I think this is also to Lillian's point again about how it is that we want to assure a kind of egalitarianism of resources uh, precisely to allow people more options in their life than they would have otherwise. The Republican concept is a really interesting one, uh, and it's what I think um, Axel Honneth would call social or civic freedom, right? This idea that it's important to exist in conditions of non-domination relative to others, and also to have a very pronounced say in the laws and institutions that govern you. And I think that Lillian is right, uh, that liberals have been profoundly inattentive to this, uh, certainly recently, uh, as they foreground the first two concepts of freedom uh, and forget the kind of Republican roots that you know some liberals like Locke or Madison were attentive to, right? Then the last concept of freedom that I think all of us uh, are concerned with, but it's the trickiest one to manage, is what we call uh, cognitive, uh, or if you want to be Hegel Hegelian, spiritual freedom, right? This ability to take second or third order positions relative uh, to the ideological frameworks that we're embedded in uh, and to adopt a critical disposition towards them. And I think that's a very tricky thing uh, for any kind of society to achieve on a mass scale for all the reasons that Marx and Foucault and the others listed. Uh, and I have a pretty good idea of how we could reconcile the first three concepts of freedom together in a liberal socialist society, but I really have no idea uh, how to get that fourth one in there. Because I don't buy into this whole idea that you know, with the advent with the ad sorry the transition to socialism, you know, all of a sudden the blinders will fall off of our eyes and we'll confront the world that we really want. I'm kind of with Zizek on the idea that ideology will be with us in one way, form, a shape, or form forever, and we're consistently going to have to confront it and push back against it. Lily. Um. Yeah, that you know the the republicanism thing. I I think that that's maybe you said something that was helpful, where the goal is to put First liberalism to, to think about individual the equality among individuals, and I think the skepticism I have been voicing has to do not that with the potential for liberal norms to to. Um, become better realized than they currently are. But there is something about the status of the relationship among those individual individuals, like the actual, the normative status of their positioning toward one another um, is something that's more than the sum of its parts. So it's more than just the kind of the moral status of uh, the individuals themselves. And maybe this is to your point about possessive individualism. Like, there's something not sufficient to me about just validating and doubling down and reinterpreting the normative status of 
the persons, something about their relationship among each other has to be under evaluation. And that's why, and because I think liberalism doesn't do that so well, I think that's why, like the organizing principles, like what is setting us in together. And I think liberalism doesn't do so well in all of the, the way I've been kind of abstractly or vaguely saying that I'm not comfortable with the self, the capacity of liberalism to become self-reflective. I think it has to do with this, that to me, the actual positioning of people vis-a-vis -vis one another, how they are in, um, disposed to react given constraints and imperatives, like, you know, the kind of what Ellen Wood would have called compulsions or Robert Brenner would call rules for reproduction. Those things have to have a status. You have to be able to criticize those things over and against uh, the way that people are interpreting their position within them. And to me, like the Republican view helps me, helps me to, to do that a little bit, a little bit better um, and, and if you want to say what liberal, what liberal norms, what will they look like? Well, they'll look like, uh, they'll be reinterpreted in light of that status, that, that what is it, how are we all supposed to be relating to one another? By what laws, by what rules, by, you know, what role do the laws of motion that Marx talked about, what role do they actually play in normative analysis? And I, I guess that's kind of my, uh my 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 issue with liberalism is i don't see them playing that much of a role okay that's great uh if we uh yes if we can get you back in a few weeks maybe for the uh so scientific socialism conversation then, then that's definitely a thread to pick up then but i want to be sensitive to everybody's time and also selfishly i want to uh uh about you know I need to uh, to get get ready to to wait at the border for for about three hours after I'm uh, after You're I'm prioritizing done. your parents and family over this man. How could this, you? This conversation. Yeah. So I want to see if we can get like three or four questions in, if that's okay with everybody before yeah, we yeah. Uh, before we break. Yeah, yeah, sure. So okay, uh, so uh, Ndungu Kamo says a discussion about the work of Roberto Unger would be interested. Uh, not a hundred percent sure, you know, the angle he has in mind as far as intersecting with this conversation. But uh, Matt, since you mentioned Unger earlier, do you want to, you know, do you want to drop anything into this? And thank you for the super chat. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I mean, I wrote my thesis on uh, Unger actually, uh, and uh, my first book uh, concerned kind of Hungarian approaches to international law and the reason why it's embedded in various. Uh, post-colonial kind of mindsets and needs to be rectified. But long story short, uh, for those people who don't know, uh, Unger is one of the founders of critical legal theory. Um, uh, he comes from Brazil, very enamored uh, with a kind of Marxist liberation theology tradition. And he brought a lot of those analytical frameworks to the study of American law in particular, uh, often trying to advocate for profound reforms to the existent legal system that would undermine uh, support for things like private property, uh, or uh, institutional constraints on democracy. Uh, he's a very interesting figure. Uh, he hasn't actually written that much about critical legal studies recently uh, because he was serving in the Lula administration for a while. And he also wrote, I kid you not, a big fucking book with Lee Smolin uh, on contemporary physics uh, published by Cambridge University Press, arguing that we need to shift away uh, from a kind of Einsteinian approach to physics and nature towards one that takes more seriously the reality of time. So a pretty eccentric guy. Uh, I haven't written about him in a long time, but he's a fascinating figure. And if people want, yeah, i am be down to talk about him at some point. I mean, who else do you know fucking sits there and publishes a book on physics and then a book on pragmatism and then a fucking book on Max Weber, right? You know, he's <laughs> an eclectic guy. Uh, fair enough. Uh, Lily, do you, do you want to do anything on this one or... Uh... No, because I don't know who that is. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's outside of my area of expertise. Yeah, I, I actually have to admit. But I think it's amazing that Matt wrote extensively about it, and I have no idea who that is. That's like That means uh, that there's like different different circles. If you're in critical legal studies, Unger is basically a fucking god. Um, okay. If you're Wait, not you in said, critical legal studies, you wouldn't. I There's really no reason you'd know about him. I, mean, it's, <laughs> I've, I had a moment when you said uh, Hungarian... Uh, perspectives on international law. When I heard that as Hungarian perspectives on international <laughs> yeah. law, possibly because I was yeah. just listening to. Uh, Shall I become Orbanists or something? Yeah. yeah, I was just listening to uh, to to uh, the 
to Chapo Trap House episode where they're talking about uh, Rod Dreher accidentally causing an international incident for Victor Orban. So uh, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I want to know more about that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Sam Dandy says, I think it's so strange to have this conversation without mentioning Prudhon. Uh, I have a uh, section. I think a, uh, I want to I actually have a, if the uh, uh, School for Social and Cultural Change where Matt and I have both taught classes online in the past, when they start up again, I was thinking about pitching to them a quite like a class where we'd read uh, Pradhan's uh, Philosophy of Poverty and then, then Marx's uh, Poverty of Philosophy because I actually think that'd be really interesting. I think there's a lot to say about that, but I, I don't know that I, I have... Uh, I don't know that I have anything succinct and interesting to say about Prudhon right now as it relates to anything that we're talking about. If either of you do, go nuts. I I don't really like Prudhon all that much, although to be fair to the uh, listener, I haven't read too much of him, so that could just be complete fucking bias on my part. I've tended to accept Marx's critique of him without really diving too much into the counter argument because, you know, life is short. Uh, I do think that he raises very important critiques of Lockean views of the natural right to property, uh, which the state then protects. Uh, you know, Proudhon takes this kind of Rousseauian perspective that property is inherently an unnatural uh, kind of condition that's constituted by state power and state oppression. Uh, I broadly accept that, right? But beyond that, yeah, don't really have too much to say. I think natural is a is a useful category here. I think so, yeah, because, I mean, this is one of the things that people have criticized Locke for, right, that he naturalizes property relations uh, and assumes that they are carried over into civil society and the duty of the state is just to protect them. And in terms of its practical implications, this obviously has had a profound impact on, say, American neoliberal rhetoric where we start to say things like, the state needs to get away from my property, right, Uh, or the state needs to protect property rights. Once you recognize that the state constitutes property rights, it politicizes the question of property exactly the way that Proudhon said, uh, and it raises all the kind of Republican questions about power relations and coercion that uh, people like Lillian are concerned about. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. I mean, I have read Proudhon, and I've also read, like, well, you know, there's like an anthology of, of anarchist thinking about property that um, I think is interesting, but I, I also, I think I do tend to just buy Marx's critique of it um that like in um like it's the things that i'm talking about like the laws of motion and the normative status of the laws of motion i just don't really like you i i don't think you're gonna find that in there And and i think that that's like why something would be too bourgeois to me is that it doesn't assess that kind of uh the mode of production as as such. And um, I, I just don't really know why I would think that Proudhon did that any better than anyone else. Yeah, I think so too. But yeah. again, don't know enough about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big uh, Proudhon fan. Uh, I, I think, you know, point people to Hal Draper's pamphlet, Two Souls of Socialism for, uh, for, for some of the stuff he says about Proudhon in there. Ooh. Good for uh, for some of you know for one reason at least uh, not a uh, not a not a a giant fan. Uh, I I do wonder about this. Well, actually, so there was a question. Uh, I'm trying to oh, and Joshua. No, I'm not. I'm not into the moral data of uh, of, of Russ <laughs> Russ Schaefer Landau. Um, the uh, I I think um, if there if moral facts were what he thinks they are, I don't know how we as people with physical brains with chemicals and stuff would ever come into contact with them. Um, but uh, in any case, there's a, I am uh, trying to find it so I can get this exactly right uh, where the question is. Um, but yeah, come on, man. Um yeah um let's see there's a recommendation for somebody named Arami O.C. Frimpong which is an impressive name goes on YouTube by the name Funky Academic uh but um there was 
somewhere in here a interesting question for uh, Lillian that I am not uh, – God, okay, I'm not finding here, but it was because it was about um, – because I think it was about like liberalism becoming reflective, so I, I might be mm-hmm. – I might be getting this this slightly wrong and misrepresenting what the listener was asking about, in which case my apologies. Um, I guess I, you know, we're doing a live stream. I guess I should say viewer, but you know, let's, you know, yeah, some people have like live streams on in the background while they do dishes or whatever. So, so let's say listener. Uh, Heroes they, do that, Ben. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, uh, so somewhere uh, buried in here, I think there was a question about what it would mean to say that you know for like liberalism to be to be self-reflective right in other words like um that uh what is you know if if we're talking about this kind of like abstraction right this 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 set of ideas like 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 what do we sort of like what are we saying you know when we when we talk about it becoming self-reflective or not i think that was the question if i could ever actually find it i will uh, we could we could correct that exactly but for now let's pretend that was the question so i think that uh i think liberalism can become self-reflective and i think matt's uh sort of vin- like vindication of a history of of radicals in the liberal tradition shows that it can be my, my question was just, can it be uh, reflective about the right things? And I'm uh, contending that becoming reflective about um, private property and of capitalism's laws of motion as such is kind of difficult for liberalism to do. Not because people can't uh, hate inequality, but, but just like a hatred of inequality is not sufficient to see why this is a form of domination. Um, I think that like the the kind of um, market imperatives that dominate the system um, encourage certain kinds of interpretations of inequality. So um, my question is not suggest like I wasn't suggesting that people can't become it liberalism is not self-reflective. It's just whether or not its internal self-reflections are a sufficient form of critique of the kind of social form in which we, we live. So, so would it be fair to describe your view when you say, you know, when you're asking this question, could liberalism become self-reflective or in what sense could be self-reflective is like, can liberal ideas, do liberal ideas have contained the resources to, to like sort of reflect or correct for, for these problems, something like that? Or, or how would you put it? Yeah. Can they correct for these problems? Can they supersede their own lim- limitations? Um, yeah, something like that. I don't think it's a, so to this question, how can a system have reflective capacities? Um, I mean, like, can the people who one would hope and expect to do something about this and like, perhaps like, from the perspective of agents who are trying to change the system, what are the normative resources that they have available? And can those resources amount to an adequate critique of the social form? So I was suggesting that I just, I have reservations about the specific normative resources that liberalism provides it's a, their ability to, to do aid the ability to do this given what agents are confronted with in the world and how those norms tend to take shape um so it's not systems that are self-reflective it's 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 the persons within it so classically from a socialist perspective like how does the working class come to like uh, class in itself versus for itself that are that's agents developing a reflective capacity about the system in which they live, not the the system itself. Can I just say something to that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to say I completely agree with your perspective on this. And I want to stress again that I think that the kind of ideological form of neoliberalism uh, that we've lived under for a very long period of time certainly is a kind of liberalism, the worst kind of liberalism. And it has been dominant and hegemonic for a uh, number of different reasons, right? Uh, But not least amongst them is the fact that it's very amenable and very flattering to the people who have benefited from systematic injustice and systematic domination for a very long time. Uh, Having lived in the United States now for a couple months, I can say that a lot of my Marxist friends are right, that there really is a very annoying kind of liberal personality here 
uh, that basically thinks that the kind of attitudes that a reasonably well-off person in New York takes constitute the height of civilization. Uh, it will never be improved upon. And the world would just be better off if everyone buys into that. Uh, I think that the irony of this is that's an extraordinarily superficial kind of outlook. And those people annoy the hell out of me uh, more than anything else. Uh, so my kind of project has always been about foregrounding precisely the kind of individuals you've talked about who are reflective about the problems uh, that you're talking about and try to draw affinities uh, between their views uh, and the views of the broader socialist tradition, right? Uh, but coming at things from just the other perspective, since most of my work is on the political right uh, and its discontents, I really do want to stress that I think that liberalism and socialism have vastly more in common than they do uh, with, than the political, with the political right. Uh, the political right has always been committed to this idea that there are demonstrably superior people, that's Hayek's term, not mm -hmm. mine, uh, and that they deserve higher place uh, within society for all these very sublime mythological, quite frankly, sometimes even uh, theological reasons, right? Uh, liberals at their best always rejected that, socialists have too. Uh, and I think strategically in terms of our conflict with the political right, we need to be looking at places where we can start to build those kinds of alliances because the far right and fascists are ascendant right now. Uh, and beyond just our kind of theoretical discussion here, I'm really looking for allies in that kind of debate. Okay. And our uh, warfare position, you know? Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, have, uh, I always like that we get a diversity of kinds of people who wander in here. Bull analysis, as long as everyone was played to the same rules, was unjust about capitalism. Uh, my own comment on that would be see everything I've ever written or ever said uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in my life. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know how to condense that to a few words, but if anybody wants to throw anything in, be, be my guest. Um, uh, not a, not a question, but, uh, Hugh says Lillian is the goat for me, although then he, uh, thanks you that, that he, he, uh, he feels bad and says, uh, I like Matt a lot though, too. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, maybe to the point of, uh, of what we just, something that Matt just said, uh, Jeff just says, uh, what does Matt think about patriotism slash nationalism? I'd argue that leftists should see these things as regressive and um, be antagonistic to, uh, to their existence. Yeah, I think that we should, right? Uh, I mean, patriotism and nationalism, uh, the very idea of the nation state is inherently a kind of reified social <laughs> identity that brings with it all kinds of ideological connotations. Uh, now, I don't think that all kinds of imagined communities are inherently bad, right? Uh, I like to consider myself part of, you know, the LCD sound system army. Uh, we don't really exist, but, you know, it's a good thing to be a part of, right? Uh, but where these kinds of imagined communities constitute uh, justifications for various forms of exclusion on the basis of discriminatory or morally arbitrary factors, then they need to be punished uh, very severely by critical theorists. And so... You know, I write about cosmopolitan socialism and cosmopolitan liberalism a lot. Uh, I think that both traditions have a lot of intellectual resources uh, to militate against the illusions uh, that are constituted by people who advocate for patriotism and nationalism. And, you know, I'm profoundly worried about the fact that these kinds of ideologies seem to have become resurgent in their popularity in the 21st century after a lot of us thought they were going to go the way of you know, the dinosaurs in the mid 20th century. And I think that speaks to the failure of neoliberal institutions and neoliberal elites to be attentive uh, to the actual needs of the people uh, who then start to see the nation state as the only site of contestation where they can start to achieve some kind of power uh, and response. Uh, I can understand that impulse, but it's led to some very reactionary politics, and I'm very worried about what the future will hold in that direction. Can I also, can I make one uh, brief response? Um, I I think that I, I, I agree entirely about patriotism and nationalism. I just want to add that I think that sometimes this makes people worried that they can't have a sense of place or rootedness yeah, yeah. or a community um, that they're not able to identify in a positive way with where they came from. And um, I, I think that it's not one way of combating this. And I think an important way, because people having, it is an imagined identity, but people need to have a sense of self and belonging. And I think constructing a positive version of that is 
uh, can be an important part of making people optimistic about social change. And there are really great things about um, in the history of conflict in every you know existing society of which I'm aware, all of which are unjust. And the U.S. is no no different, you know. And I think that um, if you can think about a social identity that's constructed around personalities like Eugene Debs or Frederick Douglass, as opposed to, yeah. you know, um, like Robert E. Lee and Thomas Jefferson, then I think it's not always bad to say that this is this is our our home, our tradition. We want to make it better. We want to to make this. Uh, we want a cosmopolitanism that has distinct, you know, distinct features that people can can identify with. Um, I don't think socialism will look the same everywhere, and I think that people will have to find and and revive and maintain uh, radical traditions. And so, I, I just want to say that that not every like drawing on on a, a legacy is is wrong, but I think I think nationalism is is wrong because that's the wrong way of doing it. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think that's 100% true. And I think this is where we can demarcate a reactionary concept uh, of yeah. what's called cultural identity and a progressive or socialistic one, right? Uh, a reactionary concept of national identity posited as an actually existent ideal thing uh, in which people participate and they have really no choice about that, right? And it's inherently exclusionary because you're either part of that identity group or you're not. Whereas a socialist approach to national identity does recognize it as a kind of artificial construct, but one that serves human purposes, allows us to create maybe democratic communities with certain kinds of values, uh, and embraces a plurality uh, of different such communities as exemplifying uh, the diversity and richness uh, of human nature. And I mean, I would argue that some liberals have been attentive to this also. I mean, mm -hmm. think about John Stuart Mill and experiments and living, right? But I think this democratic, non-domineering uh, aspect of community uh, and communal identity is really important in distinguishing these kinds of ideas from their reactionary counterparts. Yeah. I mean, this is... Also, join the LCD sound system army, everybody. Okay, I'm just going to politely ignore that. Anyway, so they have... Um, uh, like... That last part of what you said is interesting because, I mean, I remember, well, as, as Matt knows very well, uh, last summer, I was going to do this written exchange and then debate with uh, Yoram uh, Hazoni, who is uh, who's who's one of the uh, the most uh, prominent exponents of uh, post liberalism, uh, which which is a, a concept that didn't really come up in this discussion today, but you know, I I, I think is a sort of interesting. I always kind of think of it as an interesting point to 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 sort of ground um the uh this discussion because when somebody like Hazoni or or my you know past guest and ideological friend of me Sora uh, you know talks about liberalism I immediately sort of recognize what they're criticizing stuff that I think right you know that it's that like uh, a certain kind of of pluralism and you know and and and, and allowance for experiments of living and all that is is really important uh I uh and, um, but I remember, so in that Hazoni discussion, so there was this sort of very strange thing that happened where they published an extract, like REO magazine published an extract from, from, from Yoram's book. Uh, and I, I, and then they published a response by, and they simultaneously published a response by me and then he decided to withdraw the extract. So I think now you could read it and it's sort of like, I'm, uh, it's like, I'm, you know, doing the Clint Eastwood thing. I'm, I'm arguing with an empty chair. Uh, you can't you can't really tell what it's in response to anymore. But uh, in the original thing, I remember he has this thing about you know because he has this this empiricist argument for uh, for like an illiberal nationalism basically, and he uh, and and he sort of adapts that mill experiments and living thing, but it's like national experiments, you know, that like you you do you know you're sort of doing these these big collective experiments and there's something that. I have to say, does does uh, you know? I I do not like one bit about at least his his version of that, right? Because because I'm I'm sort of you know at the at the risk of sounding like a total lib about this, you know. I I have uh, I'm, I'm very. It's like no, I mean, like, what if you're uh, you know, 
you know, what if, what if you're in one of the Hazonian uh, national experiments and, you know, and your own preferences are, are different, right? I mean, what if you're, what if you're in a religious minority? What if you're gay, you know, like, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, so, so I, I, I guess I am, you know, like, uh, I, I, I do get like a little nervous when I hear that, that linkage, you know, that linkage being, being made. Right. I mean, like, I completely agree with Lillian and we talked about this last time she was on about that, Sure, I I don't doubt for a second that socialism, was, you know, would look different in different countries because different countries have different levels of development. Different countries have different inherited institutions, and you're never starting over from nothing. You know, you always adapt. You know, bits and pieces. But like, I, I guess I guess what I would get more nervous about is, and I'm not saying either of you were saying this, but that like is sort of the idea, like, you know. Like okay, national characters are bullshit, right? Like I mean, there, there 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 is no such thing as a as a national character. There are, you know, there's stuff that's existed in different societies that might or might not be sort of you know inspiring or useful to draw on, you know, for for appealing to to socialist ideals if you're within that society or whatever. But like, it's not like you know Hungarians are just sort of innately different, you know, from from English people or whatever in a way that means that you know which 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 you know in a way that means that it's like just sort of inevitably normatively right that they have a different kind of society so that 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 sort of you know bundle of of hesitations that i'm gesturing at i'd, I'd just be interested if either of you felt like weighing in on that yeah i mean i completely agree with the kind of artificiality uh of this uh i mean in canada we often say that to be a canadian is to know how to have sex and canoe uh after you know a 1973 book <laughs> Uh, which is probably the truest reduction of Canadian identity I can think of. Uh, although I don't know how to the do that. So I'm a, a, that's a, the best one I've heard that rules. I'm <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty good. Uh, um, but again, you know, this is made kind of in jest to precisely to point out the kind of absurdity uh, of trying to demarcate some essential quality that unites, in this case, you know, 35 million people, let alone 350 million or whatever the U.S. population is right now, right? Uh, I think that and from my standpoint, uh, and I think Lillian might agree with this, I just think there's nothing wrong with self-consciously establishing communities that might have differentiated rules and customs, uh, as long as there's a relative equality of power was existing within them, and they service the interests uh, of the people within them and enhance their life in a certain kind of way, right? And a good example of this that any leftist should be sympathetic towards is a union, uh, is a kind of artificial construction, has even legal implications to it. Uh, but most of us get fuzzy when we think about this idea of union activism, economic democracy, uh, and the creation of a kind of cooperative economic enterprise together, right? That would be the example of a kind of experiment in living, cooperative experiment in living that I think any leftist should endorse. And that's very different than what uh, somebody like Hazoni is talking about. Uh, again, where you have this historically reified national identity that he argues empirically exists, uh, although how could a reified identity empirically exists. This is kind of what I criticized him for, right? Uh, and you are subordinated to it and have to be bound up in the expectations that this reified identity imposes upon you. Otherwise, you're inherently excluded from it, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I will just add that I think these risks exist, but there are also risks associated with not positing any positive conception of... Uh, identity. So like these kinds of like the working class, identities. for example, like the working class. Okay. So without the idea of solidarity that comes with this idea, like, you know, there's political, there's political risks. And then um, I, so here's an example, like there are two in, in the U S right now, it's like, there's the example, like we're into like abolishing everything. Um, and then uh, people are like, what is, the alternative. So you say this, this country, there's original sin, we need to abolish everything, everything about it. Um, there's a reason there's that the, the reactionary form of nationalism steps in to kind of rescue people from the nihilism that this, some of this creates. And it's because there's no obvious alternative, like pe people like, when you're just like, I total self abnegation is not a great political motivator, except for people who don't have really, like, except for people who have something to gain by doing that, like, um, from what I can tell, like my white middle-class women on TikTok who that are like, get something really out of like taking responsibility, you know, like if you can gain something by self-abnegation, it seems 
like um, that's useful. But like as far as far as a program of social change that actually creates better relationships among people as opposed to worse over time, I don't think I think people have to have something in it for themselves, and they have to be able to imagine their relationships differently with one another. And um, I think it's good to have some positive ideals. And where are you going to draw those from, except for the context in which you actually live and the better parts of your tradition, innovating on them and experimenting with them. Um, and, you know, another example would be like toxic, the idea of toxic masculinity. People are like, what are we going to do with men? Masculinity is so toxic. Well, you know, that, that kind of like chapo thing about um, like dudes rock. It was like a joke. But like, it's kind of serious. Like there has to be a way for people to have a sense of self that isn't just intrinsically hurting other people or something. So like a positive view of that, what would that look like? I think those kinds of questions are like, you know, not bad to, to be, they're not always my primary questions, but like, they're not bad to ask. Like, what are we offering to people by way of an alternative as opposed to just, you know, making people re realize that everything about them has to be um, dismantled and, into what yeah. is the question? I also like yeah. uh, our our friend Deep State Cuba from This Is Revolution has a has a good line about how you know from a, a left perspective it may turn out to be a mistake in the long term to to encourage white people to spend quite this much time thinking about being white. Um, you yeah. know, could, could, it's 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 not hard to see how that could that could uh, diverge off in some pretty ugly and reactionary directions, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you you have your subset of people, the, these like women who will pay like you know, ten thousand dollars to have to have lunch with Sarah Rao and hear about how you know hear about how racist they are, and you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I am not gonna kick shame that, but like that's not a uh, you know, uh, yeah. I, I think that's a program with very limited appeal, right? You know, I I think that's absolutely, absolutely right and uh, and well taken. Okay, uh, read Combat Liberalism by Mao, No and You Can't Make Me. And uh, <laughs> uh, Matt, I enjoyed your recent Commonweal article on, on Yarvin. Not a question, but... Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, but it the is... The amount weird. of hatred I got from that. Fucking, like, every frog slash, like, Roman, you know, icon personality on Twitter seemed to be giving me shit for a while. And God, you know, it was such a fucking hangover. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, and I think it is, you know, but honestly, I mean, this is kind of what I was saying, you know, um, like half jokingly, but it's also sort of seriously later. I mean, like, I actually think there is some value into sort of staring into the abyss of like the, the you know, Yarvin stuff or, or you know, post-liberalism or, you know, do good or whatever, just to, uh, just to sort of, you um, help ground the discussion right because it's like okay what are the sort of things that are fundamentally wrong with what these people are saying and that might tell us something about you know what sort of parts of or you know things that are associated with the liberal project try to be very agnostic about how i put this you know like what like might be um important you know to to be to be salvaged right even as we even as we criticize the uh, the rest of it but uh, we have uh, we've gone way long. Uh, it was a really interesting discussion, um, which is which is why we did. But we have gone way long, so I do want to uh, I do want to uh, uh, I do want to wrap it up. Uh, so uh, just just give just give our um, uh, you know give uh, give our guests a quick chance to 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 say a couple final words. Matt, you want to start? Sure. Uh, well, I should just say, uh, I too have stared into the abyss. Uh, I know what nihilism is, and nihilism is reading uh, American Marxism. Uh, you know, just I can't think of anything else that will compare and make you feel that life truly has no meaning. Um, but I just wanted to say, uh, in a more serious light, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think that there's probably far less ideological distance between us uh, than mm -hmm. some of these disputes might suggest. I think that in many ways that we're searching for something similar, which is a way of reconciling the Marxist or broadly socialist critique of power and domination, uh, to use the Republican uh, term, uh, with the best aspects of the liberal tradition. Uh, how to go about doing that methodologically, practically, and certainly strategically uh, is a very sensitive question that is in many ways you know, a defining question for our age. Uh, I don't know that we have sorted it out here, but certainly I will say that reading Lillian's work has made me more confident that 
there is an answer uh, on the horizon that somebody will discover uh, or invent. And hopefully I'll get to play my part in that whenever I publish that big book on Rawls and Marks. Um, I agree. I'm, this has been really fun and I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad we did it. I, it's made me sort of um, think about my next project. I'm, I'm writing a book right now called The Competitive Constraint. Um, it's about domination and capitalism. It's very social theory heavy and it's like picking out this Republican the these Republican themes. Um, but I've, I've been thinking about what my next project could be. And I was intimidated about thinking about theorizing about re Republican socialism. And um, I, I think I'm, I'm more motivated now. Like I, I feel that uh, um, wondering how the liberal story fits into it and, and, and what the Republican ones, how it seems to, how it compels me. Um, it's making me curious and I, and I hope it makes other people curious. I hope I, what I really want more than anything is for people to think uh, beyond um, the current political constraints, which are, I think is zero sum. Uh, we, we, we understand politics as a set of trade-offs that we, that um, are imposed by the, the current ideological configuration to me seems um like it is inward looking and not outward looking. I'm just going to put it that way. And I, and I think being outward looking and looking toward the future is, is uh, something that intellectuals, philosophers, political theorists, I, I think it's a priority and, and I, I, I'm looking forward to thinking more about it. Yeah. As Thomas Paine uh, once said before he was plagiarized by Reagan, uh, we have it in our power to remake the world again, right? Uh, and I think that that's something we all need to be very committed to at this point. Nice. All right. Uh, people should be uh, people should be listening uh, to Lillian and her uh, co-hosts on what's left of philosophy. Uh, you know, reading her Jack a bit in other places. Uh, reading Matt in I don't know. I mean, he publishes so much that if you just like find a piece of printed matter at random, it probably has a Matt McManus article scrawled on the back of it. So you know, read that. Uh, that'll be, uh, that'll be interested, uh, and, uh, and worth your time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you both going to, uh, to cut it there for today. Left is best. <laughs>